discussing the first chapter of A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. So we're going to, we're going to ask each other five questions and uh, whoever answers the questions with greater clarity and correctness is going to win the debate. So are you ready? I was born ready. Okay, so the first question is this. Karl Popper said that a good scientific theory should obey the following principle. What was that principle? Well, it should probably be uh, being falsifiable because, like, for example, if you have a theory and it can't be proven false, then that means it can't be a good theory because uh, if it can't be proven false nor true, then it can't be useful at all. And you can't prove any scientific theory true because uh, you can't test infinite times. And a scientific theory becomes false as soon as there is one instance that violates that theory. Okay, that's good. So the second question is about Immanuel Kant, who in his Critique of Pure Reason in the late 1700s talked about anomalies. Or I don't know how you want to pronounce it. Antinomies. Okay, antinomies. So antinomies are two opposing scientific ideas which are incompatible with each other. What two ideas was he referring to in his critique? This is a really specific question. I don't know, Newton and Leibniz? I uh, no. The two scientific theories he was referring to was the idea that the universe was born at some time and the idea that it existed for an indefinite period of time, aka St. Augustine versus Aristotle. So those are the two opposing ideas he was referring to in his critique. I probably should have known better, or maybe I shouldn't have known better because it was a pretty specific question, but go on. Okay, and the next question is, how is Einstein's theory of general relativity confirmed? Uh, so the British actually uh, measured, uh, so what Einstein's theory of relativity said mm -hmm. is that a light is bent by a massive things. So the British tested this out by uh, looking for a star that in the sky should have been close, decently close to the sun in the sky. So, however, uh, when they looked for it, they found it was not in its approximate actual position, but rather in a, a position that was different from the real one because uh, the sun had uh, bent the light from the te uh, from the telescope, so uh, no. so the sun had bent the light that was being emitted from the star. So it seemed that the star was in a different place than it actually was. Uh, this experiment proved Einstein's theories, though it was later proven just an anomaly and not actually a proof a proof of Einstein's theories. But uh, that was it. That was how Einstein's theories were proved. Okay, good. So the next question is about Kepler. Mm -hmm. Do you know Kepler? Yeah. Okay, so Kepler is uh, well known for the three Kepler's laws, right? Yes. So there was a little debacle because Kepler did not like uh, what his equations were telling him. His equations were telling him the planetary orbits were ellipses, but uh, he did not like that. Uh, why was he uncomfortable with the results of his theory, as explained by Hawking in the first chapter? He thought that ellipses were less perfect than a uh, spherical orbit. So, so you mean circular? Uh, whatever, yeah. circular orbit. And he also thought that, it, however, he, he also thought that it didn't align with his theory that uh, there was some magnetical attraction going on between the Earth and the Sun. Mm. Okay. Yeah, and also he was kind of uncomfortable. That's correct. Also, he was kind of uncomfortable because he didn't really uh, have a theory to explain how those elliptical orbits originated. That would have to wait until Sir Isaac Newton, uh, whose uh, laws of gravitation gave uh, was were a way to derive Kepler's law without you know just from observation. Okay. Uh, my final question, are you ready for this one? Of course I am. Okay, so Hawking said there's a paradox. If we can find an ultimate theory for everything, there's a paradox to that theory. What is that paradox? Is this really... Uh, okay. 
Okay, that's a really hard question, actually. Uh, the paradox. Well, I know he wanted to first define uh, the uh, definition of a scientific theory, but we already talked about that with mm -hmm. that whole thing on, you know. Popper? Yeah, Popper. I forget that guy's name, Carl Popper. So, I don't actually know. Okay, so basically he said, if there is a theory of everything, it should describe what everything in the universe does, correct? Yes. But if that theory describes what everything in the universe does, that theory should also eliminate free will, right? Because that means it will, that theory will predict what every single particle in the universe will behave like in the past, present, and future. That means the theory itself will predict that humans will discover the theory at some point in the future. So that is the paradox if, uh, if we ever find the theory of everything. So I see I have left you open and agape. Uh, that's the, the, the climax and the cliffhanger that Hawking leaves the first chapter with. Jesus, this is making me think a lot. Okay, uh, let's move on to my question. Mm -hmm. So, my first question that I want to ask you is a pretty tricky one. What are yeah, you looking go ahead. at? It's a pretty tricky one. So, uh, I might only have four questions, but mm -hmm. what was the difference between the views of St. Augustine and Aristotle on the creation of the universe? Ah, okay. So, St. Augustine uh, believes that the universe was created around 5000 BC. So uh, that was in direct opposition with Aristotle, who believed the universe existed indefinitely because he thought it was uh, nonsense for the universe to somehow have come into life at some point in time because he thought it smacked too much of divine intervention. Smacked means suggested. Smacked. Suggested. Okay. All right. So my second question. Who really came up with the idea of the four elements? Uh, water, air, fire, and earth. Was it Aristotle or was it someone else? Uh, I believe it was a man by the name of Empedocles. It's Empedocles, or maybe I'm pronouncing that wrong too. Yeah, that's right. But uh, yeah, you're good, en good enough. Yeah. Third, what caused the question of the beginning of the universe to be brought into science? Okay, so I have uh, some things to say about that. So first of all, it was Edwin Hubble discovering the expansion, that the universe was expanding. Um, and in fact, recently we have discovered, uh, due to more observational experiments, that the universe is not only expanding, but it's expanding at an accelerating rate, which is kind of weird, because even if the universe was expanding, uh, many scientists predicted it would be expanding but slowing down. Do you understand where like, it would be slowing down in its expansion? Uh, e even before Hubble made that observation, uh, the, there was no hint that the universe was expanding, right? Well, Most uh, there kind of was, mm -hmm. because uh, there was this big thing uh, where uh, there was this big uh, a hole in Newtonian gravity where many people thought there was a static universe. So, you know, Newtonian oh, yes. laws yeah, of yeah. gravity dictated Good. that everything would fall together in a cataclysmic Good. way. And the only way for Newton's theory of gravity to work was if the universe was expanding. So that was like the biggest hit. Good, good. That's good. You found a mistake uh, that I made. So He very a... rarely makes mistakes. Trust me. No, no. I don't I make mistakes. So as I was saying, uh, basically no physicists or philosophers even uh, believe that the universe was expanding. To my Knowledge until the 20th century. Until Hubble made that a landmark discovery. So after Hubble came along, actually a uh, graduate from uh, City College, his name was a young man by the name of Arno Penzias, and he found a chicken scoop on his, um, on his radio telescope. Uh, actually, his radio telescope was gathering radiation from the early beginnings of the universe, but he didn't know that. What he thought was this uh, chicken scoop was interfering with his uh, telescope. Uh, and so he and his partner, I forget what his partner's name was, 
uh, tried to clean up the telescope, but even after they cleaned it up, they saw that the telescope was uh, reporting back signs of some radiation. Uh, and so finally, uh, they won. Do you know what they won for their discovery? Nobel Prize? That's right, you guessed it. They won the Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, I think, in the 1970s. Oh, maybe I am wrong on the date, but uh, basically they, they were the, the first ones to discover the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the earliest radiation from when the universe was born over 13.5 billion years ago. And so that also, uh, that was a huge epoch-making discovery because it gave credence, it gave credibility to the, uh, to the theory of the Big Bang. In fact, um, you talked about Hubble bringing the idea of the creation of the universe into science. The Big Bang wasn't even uh, accepted by some well-known physicists, even in the 1950s, 60s, uh, and even 70s. Uh, there's a very famous astronomer, his name was Fred Hoyle. Um, I've heard of him. Yes, he, he's kind of like Carl Sagan. Uh, he was a very famous uh, promoter of astronomy and astrophysics. But he was also a very famous physicist as well. Uh, and he did not believe the Big Bang was real. Uh, so he said that, um, you know, it doesn't make sense for the universe to have come into creation at some point uh, in time, just like Aristotle said, right? Um, so he believed in the idea of a static universe, um, if I remember correctly. Okay, I would, uh, I mean, I kind of can see his reasoning behind like a no big bang, but he seriously thought there was a static universe in the 1960s and 70s? That's yeah. like crazy. I'm uh, sorry, that, that the big bang was not real. Um, so yeah, so that was Fred Hoyle's idea. And um, basically the cosmic background microwave uh, radiation map really gave the idea of the big bang credence and credibility. Uh, so that's another big thing that brought the, the creation of the universe into the, the specter of science. Okay, on to your next question. Finally! So here's my last question. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's only been four questions. But my last question is, how did the view of the solar system change from Aristotle to Copernicus? Or if you want bonus points, even Kepler? Okay, good question. So let's go all the way back to uh, Ar Aristotle. Okay. Please don't make it long. Right, so let's start with Aristotle, right? Uh, at that time, the prevailing theory was geocentrism, that the Earth was in the center of the universe. Um, and then after Aristotle came Ptolemy, right? He had the, the spheres of the universe, one sphere designated for he the made Earth. The models. Right, one for, for various other planets um, and, and various other astronomers and philosophers at the time uh, promoted the idea of epicycles. Uh, so epicycles was the idea that uh, different, even though um, the geocentric model was completely uh, bogus, right? It did not fit the observational data. The, the modification that the early Greek philosophers made to the geocentric model was adding epicycles. And epicycles was a way for planets to orbit in circular, in circular paths uh, by adding little circles in their own orbit. So for example, let's say the... So like they were looping around their own planet right. while looping around the Earth. Right, so for example, let's say the Sun is orbiting the Earth and we know that the Sun goes in a circle around the Earth, right, according to those geocentric philosophers. Mm -hmm. Well, they're data did not fit, their theory did not fit the observational data. So what they said is that, oh, hey, what if the, the sun orbits, the sun orbits a, a small center, uh, an imaginary center that orbits around the earth. So the sun itself is kind of in, in, a, in an imaginary orbit around a center, and that center point is going in a circular orbit around the earth. So anyway, this epicycles idea got a lot of traction, uh, but at the end, it was kind of what's known as overfitting to the data. You're trying to modify your theory uh, to fit the data, and you're overcomplicating your theory in the process. So anyway, this, uh, this was all uh, put, to, put to rest with the Copernican theory of heliocentrism, uh, which Copernicus uh, published on his deathbed. 
uh, but which Galileo openly promoted. Um, and, and Galileo got punishment for that. He was yeah. nearly burnt on the stake, but he would declare a formal heretic instead of a real one. That's right. So anyway, so there's all of that story. Uh, and then um, Kepler, right? Kepler uh, stole his mentor Tycho Brahe's data. And Both he, of them worked very hard. Tycho Brahe is... Uh, I only remember Tycho Brahe for the Iron Nose. Yes, and actually he passed away due to a sad reason, which you can read on Wikipedia. Uh, but after uh, Tycho Brahe died, his um, protege, uh, what's his name? Johannes Kepler stole all of his data uh, and spent lots of lots of years, uh, I think it, decades, uh, and over 40 attempts to try to come up with the correct model, the correct theory to describe the planetary orbits. And finally, uh, at some point, um, he came up with the theory, the three laws of Kepler that we now know, that the planets go around in ellipses, that they cover equal areas in equal times, uh, that you can find the, the period of an orbit based on, on the radius and, and whatnot. Um, so that was Kepler. Uh, but sadly, as you know, he, uh, he was discomforted by his own theory because his theory suggested that the uh, planetary orbits were ellipses when in fact he believed they should have been circles. In reality, the planetary orbits are in fact very, very close to circular orbits. Um, but they were ellipses and they were at very weird angles. Uh, actually, all of the planets are coplanar, meaning that they are. Sure? That's right. All, it's a very uh, strange and amazing fact that all of the planets orbit the sun on the same plane, uh, which is very weird. Um, no. but, uh, but yeah. I don't think that. Anyway, you can fact check me on that one. Uh, because who's published a research paper? I don't know about you. Uh, you published it on the action principle. Not okay, so anyway, um, so that hopefully answers your question. Yeah. And if you want me to go into more depth about Sir Isaac Newton and how he... <laughs> Give me a hand. All right. Thank you for spending time with me here. It's been such a great time interviewing you. And uh, we'll probably have many more uh, discussions like this in the future. So thank you. Bye. Thank you for uh, taking the time. And thank you, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time.